what was in the trunk, and when he went to inspect the drugs, they, they jumped him and took his weapon and killed him. Wow. At what point in time did you change and decided even my political affiliation is not helping this situation, you decided to join the Libertarian Party. What, when did that crystallize in, in your mind? Well, I've been philosophically a Libertarian for a long time, but I have suffered uh, under the delusion that a lot of people that are philosophical Libertarians uh, that are in the Republican Party suffer under, that the, the Republican Party basically stands for the same principles as the Libertarians, but that we just need to reform the party. And I, uh, I became completely frustrated with that process and convinced that you would never reform the Republican Party. Never. Uh, it, it was uh, the status quo defense mechanisms are just too great. So what year was that that you that crystallized that in your mind? That was this year. Uh, this was in January. I'm a recovering Republican, and I've been rational for 147 days now. Um. When you made that decision, how did your wife and your friends feel about it? Did they know that you were switching parties? Well, my, my wife uh, ha knows the, the agony that I've gone through over several years uh, about what was going on with the Republican Party and the fact that you couldn't get any traction as to uh, changing things or, or reforming that party. and so. It was actually, I think, a sense of relief to her because I was a much happier person after I made that decision. And matter of fact, I could shave in the morning without uh, wondering about what I stood for. How about your friends in police work? You must belong to a retired police officers association. Did they ever ask you, what, what are you doing? Every single peer that I have uh, agrees with me privately that the war is, uh, it, uh, the agreement ranges from that the war is lost, they never win it, all the way to a vast majority just agree that we, we ought to be out of it and never should have been in it. How many people of your peers would you say, is that 20, 25? Uh, every chief that I engage in any conversation for any length of time come, uh, shares that same thing. They just can't do it publicly. Did you ever meet the former chief of Gary, Indiana, who said this 25 years ago that we ought to end the drug war? Yes, I did uh, actually meet the chief from, from Indiana, and he was considered a nut at the time uh, because of that position. And what do you think of the nut now? Uh, he was a prophet. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's very interesting how nuts become prophets. It and, really is. Uh, and if, when you find people who know enough about the issue, um, they come out the same way you did. Um, what would you recommend for people who are still re still in the Republican Party, still, you know, hemming and hawing, thinking I don't want to waste my vote? What would you say to them? Well, first off, uh, wasting your vote is is to continue to do the same thing that you've always done that gets a bad result. Uh, even Einstein said that the very definition of insanity is to continue to do the same thing over and over and expect a different result. Every election cycle we elect either a Democrat or a Republican. And every election cycle things get worse. And for us, the voters, us, the citizens of this country, if we want to change, what we have to do is we have to change. We have to change what we're doing and how we are voting. And what are you personally going to do this election cycle? What are you doing to make that change? I am giving people an honest choice. Uh, I'm sticking with the issues that, that actually affect them. It's very difficult to go and talk to people about the Liberty Tree and, and to get any attention from them. But what you can do is you can talk about the fruits of liberty and they do want to talk about that. And when you talk about the fruits of liberty to the average American, it sounds good. So you're running as a candidate for what district and what state? Uh, House District 20 in the state of Florida. And you're running as a Republican, Democrat, or Libertarian? I'm running as a Libertarian. Are you going to stick with the Libertarian I'm Party? I'm a Libertarian for life. Well, there you had it, people. My interview with retired Chief of Police Jerry Cameron, a very establishment-looking man. Uh, 
He's a recovering Republican, now a libertarian for life, he says. You heard him? I didn't put any words in his mouth. Those were his own unrehearsed interview. A chief of police saying, in the drug war, we're making things worse. That's just what Honorable James P. Gray, who you've seen on my show for almost a month prior to this, uh, Orange County judge saying, in the drug war. The reason they don't is because too many cops, too many sheriffs make lots of extra money in federal grants, and it creates more victims that need help, that go on welfare because her husband or their wife is now in prison. And the thing is a disaster. Libertarians are not asking people to everybody go out and do illegal drugs. We're just saying the drug war is making it worse. And I'm not gonna bring up little Alberta Sepulveda murdered in my opinion by Officer Hahn in Modesto when they shot the little 11 year old Latino boy in the back laying face down on his bedroom floor. That's part of the drug war, you kill little kids. But no, no, you know, there's lots of cops and sheriffs who want to go out there and let people get killed who are totally innocent. Well, there's a recovering Republican, Jerry uh, Cameron. Now, I want to go back to him and let you hear a little bit more of the interview with retired police chief Jerry Cameron. This year became a libertarian candidate in the 20th Assembly District of Florida. Back to Jerry. How do the people that you work with in law enforcement, sheriff's deputy, DEA agents, FBI, how do they respond to you now, privately or publicly? Well, of course, I, I don't have as much contact as I once had, but the ones that I were, were, uh, see on a, a frequent basis in any way whatsoever are very, very much in agreement that uh, this war on drugs is not going anywhere. It's lost. It was lost a long time ago, uh, even before it was started. Uh, they still have, uh, some of them, they still have a commitment to the war on drugs, and some of them a very strong commitment because it's the way you fund the department. And uh, they publicly say one thing, and then privately to me, well, they will say another. Is this part of the reason why more and more police officers and sheriffs and sheriff's deputies are getting arrested themselves for selling drugs illegally? Well, absolutely. I mean, you, you don't. When, when I started in the war on drugs, uh, we were approaching it as from a moral perspective. We thought we were doing society good. When you learn that what you're doing is a sham and you keep doing it, you become a criminal yourself. And these people that that become criminals themselves, uh, they don't see anything wrong with taking the uh, the drug dealer's money. Or selling drugs. Uh, uh, I've got the sheriff of the county that I was the chief in uh, is now serving, uh, I think, 18 years in the federal penitentiary. And he was actually taking seized drugs from one department and selling them in his jurisdiction. What was his name? Uh, Laurie Ellis. And did he plea bargain or did he go to trial? No, he went to trial. And a jury of six or 12? Uh, I've forgotten the details of the trial. Uh, he went shortly after I was out of law enforcement. But, okay, so that would have been about 1993, yes. about 10 years ago? Yeah, uh, I think his trial was in 93. So he still got about 9, 10 years yes. to serve before he gets out. Do you think he's going to have a, a future in law enforcement anymore after this? Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> Do you think he might become a libertarian? No, I, I don't believe he'll become a libertarian. Okay. Um, this is a problem. We see this in virtually every state where the police officers, sheriffs, are getting arrested. Who usually arrests them? Uh, it's generally the federal government that, that ends up arresting them, and that certainly leaves the question, who's arresting the federal agents that go bad? But <laughs> Yes, it, it certainly does. Um, have you talked to anybody that has explained how the CIA has an interest in the worldwide heroin trafficking? Uh, yes, I have, as a matter of fact. And what can you tell us about that? Well, I, and I wish that I, I had uh, remembered the gentleman's name. He was a DEA agent that only worked on a, a certain type of case. And in fact, in his whole career, he had only worked on three cases. And uh, one of those cases, he said, uh, led to the presidential palace in uh, Columbia, 
and the State Department stepped in and said, uh, end of the investigation. Uh, that's national interest. And that case took about seven years. And then he started a new case that led to the uh, steps of the Attorney General's office in Mexico. And the State Department stepped in and said national interest. And finally, the final case that he was involved in was uh, in the Bermuda Triangle. And there was a group of uh, gorillas up in the mountains that were responsible for approximately one third of the heroin, according to him, that was hitting the streets in the US. And they had actually killed one of our DEA agents and they, uh, they were tracked right up to this group and the State Department stepped in and they said, well, what could possibly be the national interest with, with gorillas that are selling heroin? And they said they're against communism. Is this a little discouraging to you as a peace officer? Well, certainly. I, from that point on, I, I could never with any enthusiasm tell a guy that was making $30,000 a year and had two kids and a wife at home to go out at 4 o'clock in the morning and stop some guy and use tools that I had given him to put that guy in a position where he had to make a decision and lose his wife over it and his family lose the husband and father. Uh, it, it, it certainly discouraged me from wanting to continue in any way in dealing with the, the war on drugs because it isn't really a war. So the, the issue appears from, from what you know from first-hand discussions with a drug enforcement agent who only worked three cases, is that when you track it down to the high level in the Colombian Palace or Mexico or Bermuda Triangle, is that the United States State Department steps in and says stop investigating. That's correct. Does that impugn the integrity of the United States presidency? Well, I, I think that, among some other things, has impugned the integrity of the United States presidency. So basically, what we're saying here, it appears like you're saying, I don't want to put words in your mouth, it's saying like, we hire FBI, DE agents, we send young police officers to get killed in the line of duty, and then the president holds memorials for them and says, so, so sad, too bad, but yet the presidency stops the investigation when it gets close enough, they may actually arrest somebody who'll point the finger right back to maybe the U.S. presidency. Well, of course, this agent didn't use the word president, he used State, State Department. Department. What? And, uh, and that's the only knowledge I have is what was relayed to me. Right. Do you want to identify that DE agent? I wish I could, actually. I'd, I'd love to talk with him today because uh, I had decided that I was going to be out of public life altogether at that point, and uh, it, it really just didn't stick with me. On another issue, there's a war on, on the family, a war on fathers in particular. It appears from the evidence I've gathered that a man can be arrested when he doesn't even know there's a warrant out for him for failure to pay child support or he can be stopped restrained from going home, restrained from trying to make reconciliation with a wife he didn't know had filed divorce papers. Is that a common practice? Absolutely. It happens all the time. Is it due process? I, I don't believe so. I believe it's a Fifth Amendment violation. Can you describe any cases where you had to arrest a, uh, a man who wasn't even, he wasn't attacking anybody, he wasn't violating anybody's property rights, yet he was arrested and, and sent somewhere to jail? Uh, I remember one case in particular that I think is just an arch-typical example of what we're talking about. And uh, this was, uh, I was working the extradition unit at, uh, at a sheriff's department in Columbia, South Carolina. and. Uh, I was ordered to pick up a, a guy that had been extradited from Atlanta, Georgia, and he had to go before family court. Uh, I picked him up, uh, drove him from the jail to the courthouse, which was some distance away, and uh, engaged him in conversation about how this had come about. He was actually working for UPS at the time here in Atlanta. <clears throat> he had left the Columbia area because uh, he couldn't afford to be in the area where his wife was at because they continually got into uh, heated arguments and, and, and problems that she, according to him, was provoking. 
And so he moved and got a good job in Atlanta and child support until he found that uh, she was involved with drugs and had a boyfriend and was spending the money on both. And he quit sending the checks to her and he was picked up here in Atlanta uh, and went through an extradition process, which for non-payment is a pretty streamlined process. And uh, I picked him up and I carried him into the judge and, and I, I gave him some bad encouragement on the way in. I said, well, you know, probably all you're going to have to do is convince the judge that you will start paying the payments again and you'll catch up what's back and uh, they'll let you out. And uh, when I was sitting there with him and uh, the judge uh, handed down his order, which was that he was, to, before he could get out of jail, to pay 100% of the back child support, uh, several thousand dollars in court cost, and to post a bond for six months future child support before he could get out of jail. And uh, he was stunned and I was stunned. Uh, it was one of the more egregious cases that I've seen. Well, what do you think of that? Now you've got a chief of police telling you how women who steal their children's child support spend it on their new boyfriends and drugs, illegal drugs. Well, that was from retired chief of police, Jerry Cameron, a reformed, recovering Republican who's now a libertarian. He was not the only chief of police I have done interviews that say they know sadly that the courts support these women continuing to get child support even they know these women are spending the money on new boyfriends, new boyfriends clothes and illegal drugs. But you see that's not really the issue. The, the whole issue is to get the money out of the father's pocket, reduce the dad to a slave, to a virtual slave so that they can destroy the family. And the divorce industry makes lots of money doing it. And the courts hire more court reporters and they get more guardian ad litems and more CPS caseworkers, all to destroy the family. Is that what you want? That's what's happening. But that's not the issue I went to Jerry Cameron. I just wanted you to see a lot of that interview so you would know I didn't put any words in his mouth. I gave you a long shot of that. Now, that said, there's a lot I haven't showed you. There's a lot you don't know, and CBS and NBC actually went out of their way to not tell you Republican Congressman Ron Paul from the 14th District, I think 14th or 17th District of Texas, he's a baby doctor, Dr. Ron Paul. They know him in Congress as Dr. No, because he always votes no for all their spending boondoggle programs to waste your money. He was a libertarian presidential candidate back in the 80s. Well, Dr. Ron Paul, Republican congressman from Texas, voted for Michael Badnerick, the libertarian, and supported him openly. Not only him, but that flaming Republican, Bob Barr, congressman from Georgia, I believe, also recommended people vote for Michael Badnerick, the libertarian. Did any of the C media tell you that CBS, NBC, or ABC? CNN? No, none of them told you this. You would think it'd be major news if a Democrat Congress said vote for Bush or a, uh, uh, one said vote for Kerry, but no, they're recommending the Libertarians because we're the only people that really want a limited government, a constitutionally civil rights respecting government. So I'm going to go to you, take you back to May in Atlanta, Georgia, where you will see uh, Ron Paul, Republican congressman from Texas, at the Libertarian National Convention, wowing the thousand delegates there, and then follow that up with Nancy Neal introducing Congressman Bob, uh, Bob Barr, and then James Bovard, an author of a great book. Here we go. To the underground economy, once you put a third and it would be good. 
But that, that emphasis on knowing what we pay the government uh, can come about by passing another piece of legislation I have, and that is to repeal the withholding law. Quickly, it would end if everybody was required to write a check every 30 days on our taxes. That would end very quickly. Now, my uh, my approach, which uh, of course is idealistic, not likely to happen soon, and that is to pass the Liberty Amendment. The Liberty Amendment is simply repeal the 16th Amendment, get rid of the IRS, but it takes into consideration the problem of spending. It gives the U.S. government three years to cease and desist in doing everything that they are doing that is not explicitly permitted by the Constitution. Well, there you had it, people. Republican Congressman Ron Paul, the baby doctor from Texas, who's now a Republican, but he's really a libertarian, at the Libertarian National Convention, and none of the major media showed you any of that. Nothing. Now I'm going to take you to Nancy Neal, who's in, going to introduce Bob Barr, the Georgia Republican Congressman. Nancy Neal. Terrorism and Tyranny uh, by James Bogart. We talked about that. 
the, uh, the radio show, what we do on the radio show is carried on the Radio America Network. Uh, it's picked up here in Atlanta on uh, 1190 AM, which is WGKA, on Sunday evenings from 6 to 8. And then it's picked up around the country on various stations uh, uh, during the same time slot or maybe they day the later or whatnot. And what we do, uh, I think you find very interesting, what we try and uh, what we take are very, very important substantive topics, including many of those that you all deal with here at this convention and at your local meetings and in the writings uh, and uh, educational efforts that as libertarians you all engage in, uh, issues uh, regarding privacy and federal government and regulatory matters and uh, personal freedom and so forth. And we sort of overlay on top of that a little bit of humor. I think it's very, very important uh, in, in this day. You can have a little bit of humor when you look at what Washington is doing. You, you don't have to go crazy or kill yourself, I suppose. I mean, it's just so distressing uh, with, uh, with what's going on in Washington. Uh, the, it seems that uh, each party sort of trips over itself trying to get in first place to see which party uh, understands less about the Constitution than the other one. Well, that was Bob Barr, congressman at the Libertarian National Convention. Isn't Bob Barr a Republican endorsing the Libertarian? Well, this is William Wagner saying, take back America, people. Vote Libertarian, register Libertarian. And for you people in the Santa Maria City Council, you're making a big mistake if you keep messing with public access as you have been doing by reducing the air dimes to twice a week. You think you're going to get away with that alarm poke? You're going to have Jeff Wen and a major protest on your hands. Big mistake, but hey, the City Council of Santa Maria makes lots of mistakes. Keep watching on Second Thought.